So the reason I wanted to bring this up is to establish the function of the geology of the Egyptian pyramids. So predominantly inside of these structures, there's three types of materials, and all three of these types of stones have very specific functions. So when you're looking at limestone, which is the majority of the body of the pyramids are made from limestone, mm -hmm. limestone is a dielectric material that has the capacity for storing electric fields. Then you have red granite. Red granite is also a dielectric material, but there's a very special property about red granite is that it has high content of crystalline quartz. And a lot of people talk about the piezoelectric property of quartz in regard to the function of the Great Pyramid. Mm -hmm. But in my research, I've determined that it's actually something called the inverse piezoelectric property, mm -hmm. where the stone and the quartz is introduced to an electric field, which leads to the production of ultrasound. So a lot of people talk about the sound properties of the Egyptian pyramids. And the big question is, how are these sound properties activated? Well, it's activated by the interface of these electric fields coursing through the red granite, causing vibrations within the quartz that produce ultrasound. And we'll get to that when we talk about the function of the Great Pyramid, which utilizes ultrasound as a sonochemical acoustic catalyst. Mm -hmm. So this is a sort of a breaking field in modern day chemistry where they're using sound waves to catalyze chemical reactions. And that'll be directly applicable to the conversion of sulfur dioxide into sulfur trioxide inside what I call the contact process chamber or the grand gallery of the Great Pyramid. Okay. So let me skip through. So this is black basalt, and this is going to be particularly relevant when we get back to the function of the Great Pyramid, because the uh -huh. Great Pyramid also has a black basalt temple floor on the eastern side of the Great Pyramid. And one of my most interesting discoveries was that black basalt... When you say temple floor, wh yes. where, is there a, where is there a floor? Yep. So it basically looks like this. So this black basalt flooring... This You're was, saying like the, the base, the foundation of the whole pyramid is on this? So it's just on the eastern side, very similar configuration to what you see here. And this is adjacent to the pyramid of Userkhof mm -hmm. in Saqqara. And I also have had a special permission access into the pyramid of Userkhof, which is also on my YouTube channel. Okay. And this is one of the locations where we discovered the mysterious blue stone of Egypt. There's a com okay. completely destroyed container that's made of this blue sandstone, which is a very unusual wow. material. So black basalt, even in the modern day applications, is used as a material for heat storage. And there's tons of research that specifically rep references black basalt from Egypt being tested and analyzed for a material for heat storage. Okay. So here at the pyramid of Nayusare in Abu Sir, there's this red granite con or this red quartzite actually, red quartzite conduit system. So you're looking now at the inlet of this conduit system. And this red granite conduit runs underneath this black basalt temple floor in this direction. And it leads into a red quartzite collection bowl at the end of the conduit system. And the conventional explanation for this component is that it's for drainage of rainwater. Okay which to me doesn't really make a lot of sense because red quartzite, it's, it's not an exotic type of geology, but if you were just making a drainage channel, you would just carve it out of bedrock or limestone, and you wouldn't need to go through all of the extra effort of transporting this red quartzite to the site, carving it out of a much more difficult material to work right. with than limestone. And in my opinion, you don't collect rainwater. Right. So why would you be connect, collecting rainwater drainage running off the side of your pharaonic burial? Again, the conventional story mm -hmm. is that these things are pharaonic burials. So that explanation- Pharaoh tombs. Correct, right. So why, why would you want to collect the drainage water so running was, off the side of your tomb? So this little, con this little channel that's dug into this piece of rock here- Correct. Water or liquid could drain through it. And what came off? What, what happens at the end right there? Right. So this is the collection bowl. Okay. The conduit goes underneath this black basalt floor and it deposits whatever they were collecting 
into this red quartzite collection bowl, which is exquisitely crafted. Wow. So they went through a lot of effort to make this component. And to me, this is not indicative of rainwater drainage. This is indicative of collecting something that had very particular importance to the civilization that built these things. And the first time I saw this, the immediate thought that popped into my head was aqueous chemicals, liquid chemicals, because it had to be something that was very, very important for them to collect it. And then they would do something with that chemical. Mm -hmm. So the reason that they've utilized... Yeah, rain. If it rained, that thing would be overflowing in like an hour. Right. And if you were uh, you know, draining rainwater, you would just drain it back into the bedrock or back into the Nile River. Right, exactly. And you have a huge source of water, and they could definitely purify water. So you don't need to collect rainwater drainage when you're right next to the Nile right. River, which is an abundant source of water. Mm -hmm. So that never really made sense. So this is the first artifact that completely changed my perception about the function of the Egyptian pyramids and pointed me toward the production of chemicals. That's so interesting. I've never seen this before. And this is... Um, there's so many things to unpack about this particular site, but I'll, I'll mention two things. So the black basalt paving stones. Mm -hmm. So anytime you see black basalt, just remember heat storage. Okay. So once this material gets hot, it's interfacing with these electric fields that come from lightning strikes. And we'll get to how this occurs, how it's attracted, harnessed, and distributed through the pyramid systems here in just a little bit. But electric fields are going into this dielectric material. Okay. Dielectric materials are the most important thing about the ancient science, is understanding the properties of these stones as being functional components of the Egyptian pyramids. So the electric fields would course into this black basalt, heating up the material, and it would stay hot. Mm -hmm. The reason they implemented this black basalt was to prevent coagulation of the liquid solution that was flowing through this thing and to maintain any suspended particles within the solution. So let's say you have a viscous chemical flowing through this conduit. Mm -hmm. If it gets cold, it could clog up the pipe. Right, right. So they implemented a material that could be utilized for heat storage applications because once it got hot, it stayed hot, and it maintained the fluid flow through that channel into the collection bowl. Got it. And let's say you have valuable suspended particles in this solution. And where's the solution coming from? Right, so directly from the reaction chambers. And where is the reaction chamber? This is inside of the pyramid? Inside of the pyramid, yep. Okay. How it, far away, roughly? So the base and the inlet of this conduit is right up adjacent to the eastern side of the pyramid. How, what's the distance, would you say? I mean, five feet. Oh, that close. Yeah, so okay. literally, so, so with this particular pyramid, the casing stones have all been removed off of the exterior. Mm -hmm. So the edge where the original casing stones would have been, mm -hmm. it's several feet back because you have the, the body of the core still intact, but the casing stones have been completely removed. So the distance between the core and the inlet of this conduit system is, you know, five or six feet. But if the original casing stones were still in place, it would literally be adjacent to the side of the pyramid. Okay. Wow. So essentially the conduit is running underneath this whole black basalt paving stone. Again, that black basalt, this is just showing dielectric constants, which mm -hmm. is a, a way to gauge the capacity of a material to store these electric fields. Mm -hmm. And all of these materials are dielectric materials with the capacity for storing electric fields. So I just wanted to show you that artifact. And this is basically the configuration of... And this is Abu Sir we're talking about still. Abu Sir, correct. Right. Yeah, okay. the, the configuration of the Pyramid of Nyusere. Okay. And you can see in red that, that that is the path of this conduit system. And there's another one adjacent to it as well that also has a collection bowl, which I've never found that in person. This is from the 1900s okay. from an archaeologist called Boardchart that did the original excavations of the pyramids of Abu Sir. Okay. I haven't ever found the second one, but it's on my list. Abu Sir is one of these sites that you need special permission access from the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities to go out and investigate the site. Mm. And we've been very fortunate. I always go to the sites on my tours and I have a tour coming up in November where we also have special permission access to Abu Sir. Remind so, me one more time the name of the pyramids at Abu Sir. Yep. So there's the Pyramid of Neferkare, okay. the Pyramid of Nyusere, and the Pyramid of Sahure. So there's three major pyramids out there. But Abu Sir is also adjacent to a site called Abu Garab. 
that has those white calcite crystal bowls that have almost the gear-like configuration around the outside. Mm -hmm. And they also have some very interesting, and this is just an image of, you know, the electric fields from lightning strikes permeating this dielectric material right. that cause it to get hot, maintaining the fluidity of the solution running through the conduit.